slash enthusiast enthusiast pierre Huli, aka mr p the p is for patience y'all know what time it is i told y'all yesterday i was gonna get you today all right so let's go ahead and get into it y'all already know what we here for y'all know what we here to do okay and let me find it let me find it let me find it let me find it where are we I gave y'all the new information, so we're going to start from the top, all right? There she go, old Tansy. Hey, I saw another um, I saw another account associated. Do you have a business account or another Instagram account, too? If so, I was going to follow it, but I, I just didn't know because it, it only had two posts of yours on there, so I didn't know if that was actually your page or not. But um, if it is, let me know, and I'll follow that one, too, okay? All right, so we're going to start chapter four, infection control. Let's get to it. The term cleaning, defined as a mechanical process of scrubbing. Term sanitizing, defined as a chemical process for reducing. Term disinfecting, chemical process that uses specific products to destroy, with the exception of bacterial spores. All right, federal agencies, you have OSHA, stands for Occupational Safety and Health. Okay, okay, all right, cool. I'm going to follow all three. Occupational Safety and Health Administration, a.k.a. OSHA, they are responsible for the Occupational Safety ha Safety and Health Act of 1970. All right. Um, let's start talking about hazard communication standard, which is responsible for the material safety data sheets, the, MD the MSDSs. OK, yeah, yeah, that's the one I saw. MSDSs, which later became M. <clears throat> uh, the SDS is, I'm sorry, which stands for safety data sheets. It, you have the right to know law. It should tell you everything that's going on, any hazards associated with what you're doing, all that good stuff, right? Um, they are also responsible for the HCS pictograms and hazards, which tell you like something is flammable, something is corrosive, poisonous, whatever, things like that. That's OSHA. Next agency you have is the Environmental Protection Agency, a.k.a. the EPA. Hey, Carla. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, y'all, real quick. Let's let's talk about Miss Carla right now. I know she did the damn thing with the Momentum Conference. I bet you it was everything in a bag of chips. I saw a few posts. I know it was the bomb.com. Trust me, Carla. I want to get with you when I can get with you about all kinds of different things. But um, we'll talk when I get the chance. I, I guarantee you that. But good morning. All right. <clears throat> Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. The EPA registers all types of disinfectants sold and used in the United States. Disinfectants, chemical products that destroy most bacteria, again, with the exception of bacterial spores. All right. It destroys fungi and viruses on surfaces. Two types used in the barbershop, hospital, hospital disinfectants and tuberculocidal. Hospital disinfectants, affecting for cleaning blood and body fluids from non-porous surfaces. OK, by non-porous, we mean an item made of constructive of a material that has no pores or openings and cannot absorb liquids. All right. Tuberculo, tu, tuberculocidal disinfectants, often referred to as phenolics, are proven to kill the bacterium that causes tuberculosis, in addition to other pathogens destroyed through the use of hospital disinfectants. All right. OK, what else do we have? Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. The country's going to do this. Nope, 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 nope. No. And what I was looking for. All right. Laws and rules. That's what I was looking for. Laws and rules. What are the difference? Laws are written by both federal and state legislatures that determine the scope of practice. All right. Matt, what's happening, bro? Good morning. That uh, determines the scope of practice. What each license allows the holder to do and establish guidelines. Rules and regulations are more specific then laws, regulatory agency or the state board writes the rules and determines how the law must be applied. OK, rules establish specific standards of conduct can be changed or updated frequently. Trust me, state board updates their shit frequently. I got to look at that thing almost every week, almost every uh, excuse me, almost every month and now almost every week. So they they change it all the time. It is what it is. That's the part of the business and the industry that we are in. All right. Next, infection control refers to the methods used to eliminate or reduce the transmission of infectious organisms. Barbers must understand and remember the following four types of potentially harmful organisms. One, bacteria. Two, viruses. Three, fungi. 
four parasites. One more time, bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. All right, that is a test question. Under certain conditions, many of these organisms can cause infectious diseases, which is caused by pathogenic or harmful. The P is for pathogenic right now, which means harmful organisms that enter the body. Cleaning, once again, mechanical process of scrubbing using soap or water or detergent and water. The process of disinfection involves the use of a chemical to destroy most, but not necessarily all harmful organisms on environmental surfaces. OK, cleaning, disinfecting procedures are designed to prevent the spread of infection and disease. At minimum, disinfectants used in barbershops must be bactericidal, meaning capable of destroying bacteria, viricidal, capable of destroying viruses, fungicidal, capable of destroying molds and fungi. OK, bacteria, singular bacterium are single-celled single-celled microorganisms that have both plant and animal characteristics what is a microorganism a microorganism is any organism of microscopic or sub microscopic size okay some bacteria are harmful some are harmless let's get into it real quick types of bacteria you have two you got non-pathogenic you got pathogenic most bacteria are non-pathogenic in other words they are harmless organisms that may perform useful functions safe to come in contact with since they do not cause disease or harm for example non-pathogenic organisms are used to make yogurt cheese some medicines in the human body non-pathogenic bacteria help the body break down food protect against infection and stimulate the immune system pathogenic bacteria are harmful organisms that can cause disease or infection in humans when they invade the body period that's what the difference is, okay? Non-pathogenic is harmless. Pathogenic is harmful. Straight like that. Classification of the pathogenic. This is the newest stuff we studied yesterday. Bacteria have three distinct shapes that help identify them, okay? The three classifications are coxi. They are round-shaped bacteria. Bacilli are short and rod-shaped bacteria. And spirilla are spiral or corkscrew-shaped bacteria. Now, within the coxi family, there are three of those. You have staphylococci, streptococci, diplococci. Staphylococci are pus-forming bacteria that grow in clusters like bunches of grapes. Streptococci are pus-forming bacteria arranged in curved lines resembling a string of beads. They cause infections such as strepto and blood poisoning. And diplococci are spherical in the shape of a sphere. Uh, where was I? They are subdivided into subgroups such as Treponema pallidum, which causes syphilis, and Borrelia burgdorferia, which causes Lyme disease. Okay, next we're going to talk about movement of bacteria. Different bacteria move in different ways. The term motility refers to self movement, it rhymes with mobility. That's how I remember that word. All right, um, Coxi re rarely demonstrate self movement. Bacilli and Spirilla are both capable of movement and use slender hair-like extensions called flagella for locomotion, meaning they use flagella to move, okay? That's Bacilli and Spirilla, all right? Now, we're going to go a little bit more in the new territory today. Bacterial growth and reproduction. When seen under a microscope, bacteria look like tiny bags. They generally consist of an outer cell wall that contains a liquid called protoplasm. Bacterial cells manufacture their own food through what they absorb from the surrounding environment. They give off waste products, grow and reproduce. The life cycle of bacteria consists of two distinct phases, the active stage and the inactive stage. The active stage. During the active stage, bacteria grow and reproduce. Bacteria multiply best in warm, dark, damp or dirty places. When conditions are favorable, bacteria grow and reproduce. When they reach their largest size, they divide into two new cells. This division is called binary fission. The cells that are formed as a result of binary fission are called daughter cells and produced every 20 to 60 minutes, depending on the bacteria. For example, the infectious pathogen Staphylococcus aureus undergoes cell division every 27 to 30 minutes. When conditions become unfavorable, bacteria either die or become inactive. And second, you have the inactive stage. Certain bacteria, such as the bacteria that causes tetanus and botulism, among others, can form spores by coating themselves with wax-like outer shells during unfavorable conditions. 
These spores protect the bacteria, enable them to withstand long periods of famine, dryness, and unsuitable temperatures. In this condition, spores can be blown about and are not harmed by disinfectants, heat, or cold. If favorable conditions, such as a moist environment, return, the spores can change into the active form and begin to grow and reproduce. All right. So the new information we have is the active stage and the inactive stage. Okay. During the active stage, bacteria grow and reproduce. During the inactive stage, certain bacteria um, can form spores by coating themselves with wax like outer shells during unfavorable conditions. Okay. Next, we are going to jump to chapter six. Where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Okay, anatomy, physiology. Previously, anatomy, study of the human body structures. Physiology, study of the functions. Anatomy, structure, physiology, functions. That's the difference. Okay, cool. Um, basics, well, let's talk about cells real quick. Cells, basic units of all living things from bacteria to plants. Without cells, life does not exist. Um as a basic functional unit, the cell is responsible for carrying on all life processes. All right. Now let's talk about the basic structure of the cell. Cells are all living things composed of a substance called protoplasm, which is colorless, jelly-like, found inside cells. Okay. Food elements such as proteins, fats, carbs, mineral sal salts, and water are present in the protoplasm. The nucleus is the dense, active protoplasm found in the center of the cell. The cytoplasm is the watery fluid that surrounds the nucleus of the cell and is needed for growth, reproduction, and self-repair. It is part of the protoplasm of the cell. So if I ask you what's the difference between protoplasm and cytoplasm, one of the answers you can give me is cytoplasm is part of the proto protoplasm of the cell. The nucleus is a is dense active protoplasm and protoplasm as a whole is colorless jelly-like found inside cells, okay? And last but not least on that, the cell membrane is the cell wall that encloses the protoplasm and permits soluble substances to enter and leave the cell, okay? Basically on some you can pass or you shall not pass type shit, okay? Cell reproduction and division. Mitosis, the process of cell reproduction that occurs when the cell divides into two identical cells called daughter cells. The small structures in the nucleus called centrioles move to each side during the mitosis to help divide the cell. Pretty much like that. Okay. Centriole, centriole. Now you got two, two daughter cells. Straight like that. Tissue. This was our new territory yesterday. All right. Tissue is a collection of similar cells that perform a particular function. Each kind of tissue has a specific function, can be recognized by its characteristics, characteristic appearance. Body tissues are composed of large amounts of water along with various other substances. There are four types of tissue, four types of tissue in the body. You have connective tissue, epithelial tissue, muscle tissue, nerve tissue. Okay. Connective tissue, epithelial tissue, muscle tissue, nerve tissue. Okay. Let's talk about them real quick. Connective tissue is fibrous tissue that binds together, protects, and supports the various parts of the body. Examples of connected tissue are bone, cartilage, ligaments, tendons, blood, lymph, and adipose tissue, which is a technical term for fat. Adipose tissue gives smoothness and contour to the body. All right. Epithelial tissue is a protective covering on body surfaces such as skin, mucous membranes, the tissue inside the mouth, the lining of the heart, digestive and respiratory organs. Hang on. Sorry about that. Let me let me do that one again. One of my um, one of my pages went out. Epithelial tissue is a protective covering on body surfaces such as skin, mucous membranes, the tissue inside the mouth, the lining of the heart, digestive and respiratory organs and the glands. Muscle tissue contracts and moves various parts of the body. And nerve tissue carries messages to and from the brain and controls and coordinates all bodily functions. Nerve tissue is composed of special cells known as neurons that make up the nerves, brain, and spinal cord. Okay. Now we're going to go just a little bit further today real quick. All right. Organs are structures composed of specialized tissues designed to perform specific functions in plants and animals. During the develop development of a fetus, tissues are assigned to specific functions in the body and they develop specifically for those functions. For example, 
Lung tissue would not work as part of the brain as it is designed to serve a specific function in the lungs. All right. Body systems, also known as systems, are groups of body organs acting together to perform one or more functions. That is a test question. I have seen that one before. I'm going to say that one more time. Body systems, also known as systems, are groups of body organs acting together to perform one or more functions. All right. We're going to stop at chapter six, general anatomy and physiology. We're going to jump to chapter seven. Basis of chemistry. All right. Previously, chemistry, the science that deals with the composition, structure and properties of matter, M-A-T-T-E-R. All right. And how matter changes under different chemical conditions. Organic chemistry, study of substances that contain the element carbon. All living things are made of compounds that contain carbon. All right. Organic applies to all living things and those things that were once alive. So gasoline, synthetic fabrics, plastics, pesticides are all can, considered organic because they are manufactured from natural gas and oil. All right. Then you have inorganic chemistry is the study of substances that do not contain carbon, but may contain hydrogen. Inorganic substances are not and never were alive. Therefore, they will not burn. All right. Next, we're going to talk about matter is defined as anything that occupies space and has mass volume times weight. All matter has physical and chemical properties and exists in the form of a solid liquid or gas. Now, new territory. Let's talk about elements really, really quick. OK. Why do y'all always do this to me? I, I got to I don't know which page keep doing it, but it's probably Twitch. It's either Twitch or YouTube. I got to um, I got to see what I can do about that. Anyway, y'all see it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. All right. Element An element is the simplest form of chemical matter contains only one type of atom. It cannot be broken down into a simplest substance without a loss of identity. There are 118 different elements known to science today with 98 of these occurring naturally on earth the remaining elements known as synthetic elements are produced artificially or through synthesis and do i want to go a little bit further let's see let's see let's see mm, we go just a little bit further all right all the matter in the known universe made up of elements that have their own distinct physical and chemical properties each element is given a letter symbol such as o for oxygen S for sulfur or H for hydrogen. Elements are made up of atoms. The atomic number of an element indicates how many protons are in one atom of that element. If the number of protons changes, the element changes. Okay. Um, you can find all these elements in the complete periodic table of elements. And one more atoms. They are the basic building blocks of all matter and are the smallest particle of an element that has the chemical identity of the chemical. At the center of an atom is the nucleus that is made up of subatomic particles of protons with a positive charge and neutrons in with no charge. So you have P and N. So the P is for particles of protons and positive and neutrons with no charge. The nucleus is orbited by electrons, E, with a negative charge. As the basic unit of matter, atoms cannot be divided into simpler substances by ordinary chemical means. All right, so we're going to stop there for basis of chemistry. We're going to jump to basis of electricity. And electricity is not matter. Electricity is a form of energy, with a capital E, that produces physical, magnetic, chemical, or thermal effects when in motion. This energy is created by the flow of electrons, which we just talked about, between atoms. Okay? See how all this stuff coincides? An electric current, flow of electricity along a conductor. A conductor, any substance material medium that conducts electricity. Insulator or non-conductor is a substance that does not easily transmit electricity, such as rubber, silk, drywood, glass, and cement. They are good insulators. They do not conduct electricity well. Um, <clears throat> electric wire composed of fine twisted metal threads, which is the conductor, covered with a silk, plastic, or rubber coating, which is the insulator. A complete electric circuit is the path of an electric current from the generating source through conductors and back to its original source. Types of electric current. You have direct current, constant, even flowing, travels in one direction only, uh, excuse me, travels in one direction only, produces a chemical reaction. Battery, battery operated instruments like flashlights, cell phones, cordless tools, they use direct current or DC, just like a car battery. Alternating current, rapid and interrupted current, flowing first in one direction, then in the opposite, produces a mechanical ap action. 
Electric clippers, hair dryers, other tools or appliances that plug into a wall outlet use AC. I'm a bigger fan of AC with my clippers. I like corded clippers. I still like that 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 power flow that goes between them, even though I am not knocking any cordless clippers. They got some awesome cordless clippers out there, but I prefer the type that um plug into the wall directly. Converter apparatus that changes DC to AC or direct current to alternating current. A rectifier is an apparatus found within a power supply or adapter that converts AC to DC. So alternating current to direct current. Okay. Rechargeable cordless clippers and battery chargers use a rectifier to convert the AC from an electrical wall outlet to the DC needed to recharge the batteries. A rheostat is an adjustable resistor that is used for controlling the current in a circuit. Many devices such as light dimmers use a rheostat. All right. Real quick. Um, differences between DC and AC. Direct current has a constant even flow. Alternating current has a rapid and interrupted flow. Direct current travels in one direction. Alternating current travels in two directions. Direct current produced by a chemical means. Alternating current produced by a mechanical means. All right. We will stop there with electricity. And um, by the way, electricity is a short chapter. All right. Now let's get to the good stuff. All right. The skin structures, disorders, diseases. Let's talk about it real quick. All right. Healthy skin. Slightly moist, soft, flexible with the smooth, fine grain texture. The slightly acidic pH of healthy skin pro provides a protective barrier against organisms that touch or try to enter it. All right. Let's talk about the two layers, <clears throat> the epidermis and the dermis. The epidermis is also known as the cuticle or the scarf skin is the outermost protective layer of the skin and is the thinnest layer. It is the thinnest layer of the skin as well. Epidermis contains no blood vessels, but has many small nerve endings. They, they, uh, the epidermis are, is, is composed of layers, which are also called strata. And we'll talk about them. We'll, we'll list the five of them, right? You got the stratum corneum, stratum lucidum, the stratum granulosum, the stratum spinosum, and the stratum germinativum. Okay. Those are the five strata. Um, in a next study session, we'll probably talk a little bit more about the layers, but those are the those are the five layers or strata of the epidermis, which is the thinnest layer of the skin. Next, we're going to talk about the dermis. The dermis is the underlying or inner layer of the skin. It is also called the derma, the corium, the cutis, or the true skin. The dermis is about 25 times thicker than the epidermis. 25 times thicker. Let me say it one more time. The dermis is about 25 times thicker than the epidermis and consists of a highly sensitive vascular layer of connective tissue. Within this structure are numerous blood vessels, nerves, lymph and oil glands, hair follicles, erector pili muscles and papillae. I'm, I'm going to get I promise you I'm going to get that term right. I'm, I'm, I say it different ways all the time. Please bear with me. OK. Dermis consists of two, the dermis. So you have the epidermis and the dermis. And then within the dermis, you have two more layers, the papillary or superficial layer and the reticular or deeper layer. OK, the papillary layer. Oh, come on. OK, I'm back. Sorry. The papillary layer lies directly beneath the stratum germinativum of the epidermis. It contains small cone shaped projections of elastic tissue called papilla that point upward into the epidermis some of these papilla contain loop capillaries which are small blood vessels others contain small structures called tactile corpuscles with nerve fiber endings that are sensitive to touch and pressure also this layer contains some melanin melanin which is skin pigment i think we all know that one okay that is a test question, by the, by the way. That is in the papillary layer. All right. Space at the top of this layer is the epidermal dermal junction where the two layers meet. So 
That junction is in the papillary layer, which lies directly beneath the stratum germinativum of the epidermis. So the last, the bottommost layer of the epidermis, right below that is the papillary layer, okay? Then you have the reticular layer. It is the deeper layer of the dermis, which supplies the skin with oxygen and nutrients. The reticular layer contains the following structures within its network. Fat cells, sweat glands, blood vessels, hair follicles, lymph glands, erector pili muscles, and oil glands. All right. We are going to stop there for chapter nine. And actually, I think what we're going to do. Let's see. What's the other? Okay. Yeah. We, um, we're going to call it for now. Yeah. We're going to call it for now. So I'm starting to learn my time restraints and constraints again y'all bear with me but yeah we're gonna stop today for the full court press be ready for another full court press coming I, I might even do another one today just to go a little further with um properties and disorders of the hair and scalp and treatment of the hair and scalp so i don't know we'll see but we got a lot done today we got a lot of new information we we covered a lot of old information this is my type of study okay but yeah, for my students, you already know I'm going to be going over this stuff all day long. That's why we call it the full court press. All right. For everybody else, I will see y'all soon. I'm your instructor, Pierre Hui, a.k.a. Mr. P. The P is for patience. All right. Happy hump day, everybody. We're going to jump off of this thing. Peace. And here in this one.